speaker 29. <laughs> Yo. Yo is like the evolution of oi. It's kind of this unfolding thing. It's great to be here, and I just, as we start, want to just notice, I don't quite know where I am. I know it's Sin City TED Talk. It was on my schedule. I'm showing up, and I just noticed it as I was just kind of wandering the back room and watching. There's some, I don't know who they are exactly, but you can feel a kind of group of people here, maybe 15, 20 people who know each other, and who have this kind of community of caring between them. You can actually feel it in the room. So I want to dedicate this talk to that community of caring. Whoever you are, you're holding a beautiful space, so thank you. So let's start with a, um, with a chant. Let's start with a chant because that's what we do in Hebrew mysticism, which is my native tradition which brought me to world spirituality. You willing to chant with me a little bit? Everybody, you got some drums? I've written a lot of footnotes, many books I know are Aramaic, so you can chant with me. Here we go. Bum ba dum ba dum da dum bum ba dum give me some beat dum ba dum ba dum ba dum bum ba cheap seats in the back dum ba dum da dum da dum ba dum da dum da dum da da dim ba dum da dum da dum da here we go love the earth say love the earth say love the earth Oh, love the sky, love the sky, say heat of fire, a drop of water, drop of water, I can feel it, I can feel it in my body, in my body, in my spirit, and in my soul, try it again, say love the earth, say love the earth, oh love the sky, oh love the sky, say heat of fire, a drop of water, drop of water. I can feel it, I can feel it in my body, in my body, in my spirit, and in my soul. Part two, left hand up, left hand up, left hand up. Hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, ho. Let's go say hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, drum roll. Ho! Okay. So here we go. I met a man many years ago named Yosef Bagun, who was a prisoner of conscience in Russia when there still was the Soviet Union. Some of you remember perhaps the Soviet Union. And he talked about how the dissidents in Moscow essentially brought down the Kremlin. And they said they did it with a joke. And the joke was about a man named Rabinowitz who had applied for an exit visa to Israel. He, his request had been denied. And he just didn't really know what to do. And so here's what happened. Lenin, you know, many, many, many years back, right, had made a historic trip to Poland. And at a particular time, Jaruzelski, who was then the prime minister of Poland, was going to receive a visit from Brezhnev. And Brezhnev wanted to bring Jaruzelski a present. Wasn't sure what to bring him. So he ordered from the Moscow Academy of Arts a painting of Lenin when Lenin was in Poland. Now, the problem was that that trip never took place. Lenin was actually never in Poland. But at that point, Soviet Union, Brezhnev wants a picture. You've got to make a picture. They're not sure what to do. They call Rabinowitz. Because Rabinowitz is kind of very wise and, you know, kind of old Jewish man. And they figured he'd know what to do. Three weeks later, they're at the inner sanctum of the Politburo. And, you know, in walks Brezhnev, all the cronies of the Communist Party. In walks Rabinowitz, you know, drape cloth, easel, canvas, you know, takes off the, the canvas and, you know, shows it to everyone. And it's a man and a woman you know, profoundly undressed, you know, and profoundly engaged. So someone says, you know, I don't understand. Like, what's going on here? You know, who's that man? You know, he says, that's Trotsky. I don't understand. Who's that woman? That's Ilya, Lenin's wife. I don't understand. Where's Lenin? Lenin's in Poland. Okay. So, <laughs> so Bigun said that that joke went around Russia in the early 70s and undermined the Soviet Union. Because the joke pointed out that there was no story. There was no narrative. That the story was being created. The story was fabricated. And the profound need that we have is to live in a story that's real. 
to live in a story which hasn't been deconstructed, to live in a meta-narrative in which we actually understand in some profound way that that which unites us is so much greater than that which divides us, to live in a shared context of meaning when through the virtual realities that we all live in, there's a kind of meta-narrative, there's a kind of shared depth meaning structures that actually create a global commons not only of industry, not only of capitalized globalization, not only of commerce, but a global column, you know, a global commons of deep structures of meaning. And out of that impetus, we began this vision of unfolding a world spirituality. And what a world spirituality is at its core is a reclaiming of a shared vision, right? A yearning to identify what are the patterns that connect, right? A yearning to understand what are the depth structures that actually unite us. And a world spirituality is not, and I'm going to give you an example of a world spirituality teaching in a moment, but a world spirituality is not interfaith. It's not interfaith. Interfaith was very lovely. When it started, it was beautiful. It was respect. It was honor. But it lacked a deep engagement in the depth structures of spirit. Someone once said that interfaith, and I can say this, tell this, tell, say it this way because I'm a rabbi. I get to say it, right, was when Jews who didn't believe in Judaism got together with Christians who didn't believe in Christianity and discovered they had a lot in common, right? So there was something very kind of pallid about it. You know, and the opposite of the holy is the superficial. Right? And then we had the perennial philosophy. And the perennial philosophy on which Ken and I both cut our teeth is basically the shared depth structures of all the great traditions as that which should guide us. But that shouldn't guide us. Why not? You tell me. Because the great traditions are beautiful, they're holy, they're stunning, they're sacred, they're deep, but they're pre-modern. Right? They're pre-modern. So if we're going to actually be guided by the shared depth structures of pre-modernity, we've made a regressive move. We've gone backwards. So a world spirituality has to integrate the best and deepest insights of the pre-modern, the modern, and the postmodern, And we have to weave those together in a vision right, that actually allows for right, a shared story that we can actually transmit and hold and live in. And it's not that the story knows everything. There's so much we don't know. We hold the uncertainty. We dance in the mystery. But there's also that which we know, that which we actually can taste, we can feel. And we know it not because we have faith. We're not interested in faith. We know it not because it's a dogma that someone told us. We know it because we have first-hand, first-person experience after having done experiments of spirit, having done them in double-blind structures all over the world for thousands of years. We've gathered the results. We've checked them with the community of the adequate, which is precisely the scientific method. And we've revealed, using the faculty of the eye of the spirit, a shared story, which actually is one that can unite us. So I want, with your permission, right, to tell you a little bit of that shared story in the few minutes that we have. What's a shared story? What's a shared vision? And the depth of it is, the, the beginning of it, the middle of it, and the end of it is the story of enlightenment. And I want to talk about what that means. And what does it mean to kind of look towards a democratization of enlightenment? What might that mean? So let's start with enlightenment. What is it at its core? Enlightenment is very simple. Enlightenment is sanity. That's what enlightenment means. Enlightenment means to be sane. To be sane is to know your identity, right? It's to know your nature, to know who you are. If I said, I am the guy with the turquoise shirt, right, Alex, right, who's been communicating with me via email, right, that's, I'm Alex. And I kind of say it for a few minutes. You laugh the first time, it's cute the second time, but if you really think that I believe it, I'm insane. And I'm crazy. I don't know who I am. I don't know my nature. I don't know my identity. Now, let's just understand this deeply. Normal consciousness is insane because normal consciousness produces suffering. 100 million people in the 20th century died brutally as the result of ego-contracted, coiled normal consciousness. So sanity isn't normal consciousness. Sanity is right, an awakened consciousness in which I begin to realize my identity and my true nature. Okay, so from a world spirituality perspective, taking the best insights of psychology, neuroscience, right, systems, right, enlightenment teaching, what is the story? What is the enlightenment story? What's the new enlightenment story which can actually invite us into this democratized world of enlightenment in which people don't destroy each other out of normal consciousness, which we don't have a world ridden by 17 million slaves. We were taught that slavery was over, right? But it's not. We know there's 17 million slaves in the world today, right? Labor slaves, sex slaves. What we were taught about in the United States, which was supposed to be over when Lincoln made the Emancipation Proclamation, it's not true. 
Or we wouldn't live in a world in which 20 million people died every year, children, right, of starvation, right? That's what normal consciousness produces. So if we're actually moved by love, we want to actually transcend. We want to end the trance of normal consciousness and access an awakened consciousness. What is that awakened consciousness? So here we go. What is it? What's the quality of awakened consciousness? So step one, right? I awaken to my true nature, and I realize that my true nature is that I'm not separate, I'm not a part, but I'm part of. I'm not a skin-encapsulated ego. I'm not a separate self. I actually participate in the seamless coat of the universe. There's no separation between me and it, and separation at its core is an illusion. That's part one. That is the, it's part one, it's a critical part one. It's essential, it's true, but partial. That is the first step in the Enlightenment story. That's the Enlightenment story that was told by the great traditions in, in different forms. Now we need to go step two. And why have we resisted that story? Why has that story never caught on, right, in the Western world, for example? Why is it? Because it violates something essential in our intuition, which needs to be incorporated and integrated into our new universe enlightenment story. And that is, actually, although I may not be a separate self, and I may not be separate or apart, I still experience myself as special, as has been pointed out here today. I still experience myself as unique, I still experience myself as an individual. So let's go deeper now. When I actually drop down into my consciousness, not of separate self, but of true self, my classical enlightenment state, what I actually begin to realize is that my true self has a unique perspective. And that unique perspective of my true self is actually shared by no one else in the world but me. There's something that I can see that no one else sees but me. There's a way that God, and the God you don't believe in doesn't exist, the post-mythic God, right, the God that is the love intelligence and the love beauty of all that is, that transforms and lives, right, and holds us and is beyond us, right, right, that God is having a mark experience, right, that there's something that I can do, that I can be and become that no one else can do but me, that there's a particular nature that I have which is utterly and radically unique. I awaken not to true self, which is part of the one, but I awaken to unique self. And what unique self is, is the particularized, individualized expression, the unique emanation of all that is that lives in me, as me, and through me. It's the experience that God, and again, the God you don't believe in doesn't exist, but I like the God word because it resonates. It says something, that God loved me so much that he, she, it, the process, signed his, her signature all over me. Oh, my God, right? Depression is replaceability. Right? Depression is the experience that if I wasn't here, someone else would somehow do it. The beginning of joy is not the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness doesn't work. Pursue happiness, it runs in the other direction. Right? But the pursuit of happiness, you realize happiness by pursuing something passionate that's not happiness, and happiness emerges as a byproduct. And what's the pursuit of that other thing? Living my story. Not my ego story, that's the story I leave behind. My unique self story. That's the movement that moves me beyond loneliness. Because what is loneliness? Loneliness is the inability to share my soul print, right, my unique self with another person. And what does it mean to love someone? What does it mean to be a lover? We see that joy is a byproduct of unique self-living. We see that loneliness is sharing my unique self, my soul print with another person. What does it mean to be a lover? We talk about love so much. And it's the ultimate word that's lost almost all meaning in the way we use it. Right, so what does it mean to love? Love's not an emotion, right? Love at its core is not an emotion. You can't command an emotion as Levinas already pointed out, right? Love at its core is a perception. Love is to see. What do I see when I love? I see your true nature. I see your infinite specialness. Love is a unique self-perception. So all of a sudden, love takes on a new meaning. Malice, what's malice? Malice is the denial of the infinite dignity and adequacy of your unique story. And I say you don't have a right to live it. And I don't have an obligation to receive it. And I don't need to create the conditions to support the ability for you to live that story in the world. And that's malice. What does it mean to be a parent? A parent means not to make your child happy. It's never going to work. Right? Because happiness is a byproduct of unique self-living. So being a parent is to create the conditions to allow your child to emerge into his or her unique self. So what unique self begins to do is change the entire story. We begin to understand, to feel into Right, the experience of my infinite uniqueness, not as a quality of a Myers-Briggs test, not as an Enneagram quality. Right? Enneagram describes who I'm not, not who I am. 
Unique self is an enlightened quality of consciousness when I've actually, step one, evolved beyond exclusive identification with the ego, step one. Two, contacted, lived in, accessed the transcendent, true self, classical enlightenment, or at least a glimmer of the transcendent. I've experienced what it is to, to efface the sharp and jagged edges of my skin encapsulated ego. Then step three, I then awaken right, to my unique self. My unique self, which is the utter explosion of joy, and my unique self creates in me, stay with this, right, unique gifts that I can give that no one else can give, which in turn creates from a second tier of consciousness a new understanding of obligation. Obligation we've thrown out. What's obligation? Obligation actually exists. What's obligation? You're with Mother Teresa on an island, for example. Okay, you're stuck there. She was a wild woman, right, not that pleasant, right? You're never going to be redeemed, never going to be rescued from the island. You've got enough food for a long time. She's scuba diving. Right, she breaks both arms. You happen to know a little red cross. You fix both of her arms. Both of her arms are straight out. She's been annoying you like hell. You've been on the island for like three years. Right? Do you feed her or don't you? Option or obligation? Obligation. Of course it is. Why? Well, because there's a need, number one. Number two, you recognize the need. Number three, it's an authentic need. And number four, the need can't be filled by anyone but you. Four qualities of a new tier of consciousness which creates obligation. To actually live your unique self is to actually experience that there's a need in the world that can be addressed by you and by you alone. There's a gift to be given. There's a song to be sung. There's a poem to be written. There's a way of living, laughing, loving, and being that's yours and yours alone. That's what it means to live unique self. It's to live into the unique obligation which expresses itself as the powerful joy which creates right, the community. It creates the evolutionary we space that allows us to unfold. Because you can't have evolutionary we space, which merges out of collective intelligence from egos getting together because they're grasping, they're jostling each other, they're elbowing each other, right? That won't work. You can't have evolutionary we space created by true selves or enlightened bliss because they're lost in the one. There's no community. There's no creative tension, right? There's no, right, evolutionary emergence. You only create evolutionary we space out of a community of unique selves which realize that uniqueness is actually paradoxically the currency of connection. Because uniqueness and separateness are utterly separate. And the mistake of the great traditions was to conflate uniqueness and separateness. They said, move beyond your separate self because it's the source of all suffering. But they conflated separateness and uniqueness, so they said also, move beyond your uniqueness. Wrong. You move beyond your separate self, and then you access, incarnate, right, the divine that lives in you, as you, and through you, as a unique letter in the cosmic scroll in which you sign your name in the book of life, and you create a dimension of living that can be created by you and by you alone. Oh, my God. Right, what a vision. That's a world spirituality vision. That's a vision that we can share. That's a vision that emerges out of the great traditions, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. That's a new universe story. I'm going to end for just the seconds that we have with just a mention of my son, Eitan. In this mythic meeting between us that we've talked about many times, I was going to give a speech in Norway, you know, a part of a three-week tour. I'm running out of the house. Eitan gives me, like, a box with stuff in it. He says, Abba, in Hebrew, says, Kachat Zeitcha, take this with you. I say, sure, Eitan. And I go and I, you know, give my speech, you know, for three weeks in Norway, do the thing. And I, I come back, and it's midnight. And Eitan looks at me when I walk in. He's five years old. And I look at him, and, like, a little tear drops. And he says, Abba, like, Dad. And I'd forgotten to look at the box. And I felt like it wasn't worth being born. Like, oh my, I didn't look at this box. I mean, what a, right? oh my God. And I say, Eitan, if short old chance, could I have another chance? And his tears kind of dripping. And he says, whatever. So I go and I get the box. I open the box. And in the box is, is a, a shoe, right? A shoe horn. It's the pen, the cross pen. If you remember cross pens I used to like to write with. It's a picture of his mother from a book or its own paper. All right? It's the door handle of our first apartment in Jerusalem. And I said to Eitan, Eitan, what's this stuff? He says, Dad, Abba, ze dvarim sheli. Natati He says, Dad, that's my stuff. I gave it to you and you didn't receive it. Right? We all have a box. And that box is our stuff. It's the utter uniqueness and gorgeousness right, of who we are as unique expressions, emanations of all that is who hold infinite power, infinite creativity, infinite obligation, and infinite responsibility. If we only realize, in our last sentence, that every human being has a story, and that the hallmark, the defining characteristic of spirit, of world, of being together, is that story needs to be honored. It has dignity. It needs to be received. It needs to be rejoiced in. And let it be so. Amen. Thank you.